Thanks for doing it. Thank you, Joe. So we're going to cover uh, quite a few things, but the thing I want to make everyone aware of is, is that unlike dental school where we um, refuse to answer questions, uh, I remember Dr. Yu in our uh, physiology course that he had the uh, the physiology of the kidney wrong. And I've got a degree in biochemistry and physiology and, you know, occasionally we try to point out, you know, how that worked. And he said, no, 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 we, we'll talk about that later. And the last day of our freshman class, the last hour of the last day, when a question arose on the final examination, he said, we'll talk that later. And the whole class broke up. They, there was no later for him. We're never going to see this guy again. What do you mean, talk that later? So, anyway, so if you have any questions, we'll talk about them later. So, there you go. Uh, he's not wrong. That's a good way to handle it. And if you don't know the answer, we'll talk about it later. So, the, uh, the Academy of General Dentistry will give you credit for taking the course, but I have to, you know, give you this disclaimer that I don't have any financial interest in any of the products that are in my talk. And that any of the companies that I denigrate, uh, the, oh, offering grant monies for this uh, continuing education, medical education program, I don't have any uh, uh, financial interest in those either. So, and you know, if they go bust, that's okay with me. Um, so anyway, um, the Academy of General Dentistry wants to make sure that there's no conflict of interest, which is, is a very good idea. Uh, it could be applied in a number of other areas, but we were uh, going to talk about fluoride this morning, and uh, and I'm going to poke at some of the um, dogma that we all memorized in dental school. And the, the, the dogma that we memorized is fluoride is good and safe and effective. And if you think about that, that's really a mantra. And so when you want to learn to meditate, what you do is you, um, safe and effective, safe and effective, safe. And so if you just say that long enough and hard enough, it'll be true, right? But in order to get something approved as safe and effective, generally they require you to submit some evidence to a third party to determine the truth and veracity of that statement. So we'll go through what happens when they did that. So anyway, um, what I'm telling you is that I don't care if you use fluoride yourself. I don't care if you brush your teeth with fluoride or use a topical fluoride in your office. I would recommend against it because, you know, there's a lot of things that work a lot better, and I'll give you those too. Because where my background, the reason I got into this whole issue of biological control of perio and the fluoride issue and all that stuff is that I was into preventive dentistry. That prevention was the thing that drove my practice, and it was the uh, magnet that pulled people from miles away to my practice in downtown San Diego because we knew how to stop dental disease. 
And it's not a secret. It's just not taught in dental school. You know, it's, and you know, I graduated from dental school in 1971, and 1960s, Paul Kaiser got a, a prize from dentistry for discovering that the bug strep mucans caused the tooth decay. And in 1978, a lady published an article about her recovery from intractable periodontal disease, and they started calling Dr. Kai's bad names. Well, wait a minute. One minute he's a hero, and the next minute he's a bad person. I wonder when he changed. But if you're just stopping tooth decay, oh, that's a good thing. He, worked, he was a researcher for the National Institute of Dental Research and NIH, and so that's a good thing. But when he treads on the toes of specialties and it damages economic interest, it, it got a totally different response. I, I, don't think, I don't think I'm talking to the people that I went to dental school with, but when, when Bob Barkley flew down from McComb, Illinois to, to Kansas City, and he had a whole student assembly, there were 400 plus students out there and the faculty, and the senior on the right, my right side was mad because he's just get my degree and they figure out how to stop the disease. Darn, well, I'm going to pay off my student loans. I'm just open up a new office and they figured out how to stop dentistry, dental disease, and he was mad. The junior on my left was skeptical. He said, you know, I've been in school here nigh on three years and I've never heard this kind of stuff before. He said, I... That can't be right. I mean, it seems like it would have been covered, you know, by the all the classes that I've taken. And so he was verbally mouthing off in the in Bob Barkley's lecture. And, and Bob talked about the uh, the original dentist, uh, you know, Thor, and uh, he had a had found a rock that was kind of contoured like that, and so he called that his dentalese rock. And then you know he would say to this client who was sitting in the chair with a terrible toothache, and he said to his client, he says, say, isn't that a saber-toothed tiger? And when the guy looked like that, he hit him upside the head with a rock and knocked eight teeth out. And, and Bob said, the only difference between Thor, the original dentist, and the dentist today, we get them one at a time. So, but at which some of the students in the University of Missouri at Kansas City, not far from here, by the way, um, when they did a, 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 a program with the local dentist, they learned about the 32 tooth cleanout. And they would, in the dentist's office, and somebody would come in and say, I need a set of dentures. And they'd say, fine, pull these 32 teeth and we'll make dentures for them. And yeah, I've never seen a mouth with 32 bad teeth. They just rip them out because that was what they did. And it was shocking to the students, but it was still common practice in the Midwest in the in the 70s, anyway. I don't know <clears throat> if it's still true or not, but uh, anyway, it was a, a shocking thing. But you know, it doesn't have to happen. You need 32 healthy teeth, not 32 teeth in the wastebasket. And I'm going to tell you how to do that. Um, I was invited in uh, 1999 uh, by the People's Republic of China to uh, come speak at their fluoride arsenic conference. Now, I asked uh, uh, Gao Hongxin, the dean of the medical school, that invited me to come talk. I said, why are you having a conference on two toxic elements? He says, oh, because fluoride and arsenic always go together. Who knew that? And it hard water, Colorado, um, Texas, parts of Oklahoma have high natural fluoride. Did they tell you they also have high natural arsenic? Well, arsenic at four parts per trillion, four little drops in, in, the, in a football stadium for 70,000 people filled to the top with water, four drops is four parts per trillion. Four parts per trillion arsenic causes one cancer in a million. So we actually end up, when we talk about fluoride and arsenic, you need to know what, how they act together, or maybe you don't. What you really need to know is how to avoid them, because <laughs> you don't really care how they act together. The less is best. And so fluoride cripples people in, in, uh, in China. And um, it also cripples people in Missouri. Um, this this lady is article was uh, in one of the medical journals uh, um, recently, uh, and it was uh, a lady that uh, 
liked to drink Lipton iced tea, and that uh, she had uh, well water that was well within the uh, EPA standard for a lifetime of uh, ingestion. And even her tea after she made it was within the EPA's standard for lifetime ingestion of, of fluoride in water. And uh, she went, this, this was a long, drawn-out thing because she kept complaining about lower back pain right in the middle of her back. Uh, she'd go in and see the doctor and say, it's really hurting back here. And the guy would say, oh, I don't know what it is. Finally, he took an x-ray and, um, and a history and found that she drank a gallon or two of Lipton iced tea every day. And he took an x-ray of her lower lumbar spine and see how white it is in the middle there? The, this, this whiteness is where fluoride accumulates. And why it accumulates there, nobody's really sure. But it accumulates there, and that basically causes people to be bent over because they can't stand up anymore. But much, much earlier, you have low back pain. Now, how many people do you know that have low back pain? You know, I feel like Rodney Dangerfield because I, I very seldom get any respect. And my sister-in-law has been taking Celebrex for years for her low back pain. She lives in San Francisco, in San Leandro, in the Florida community. And they never would listen to me. They're making the coffee every morning with the man, tap water, yada, yada, yada. And then finally she got nurse. And she finally got kind of concerned about taking the Celebrex because uh, see, it seems to increase your risk of heart attack. And so she quit taking the Celebrex and decided to start drinking uh, fluoride-free water, and her back pain went away. So, you know, I get no respect. It, they, it was, here's a lady that is very grateful to the People's Republic of China for taking the fluoride out of the water. She can't stand up. But what she's telling the, the people there, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the fluoride out of the water because my back doesn't hurt like it did. Because the key symptom to fluoride early on is pain. And who knew that? Pain is the first symptom of fluoride poisoning, not the last, but it's the first one. And so this lady, when she was 20 years old, had so much fluoride in her spine that she was paralyzed. It actually made her, her legs not work. She could not move her legs. And you have all seen dogs like that, haven't you? Well, if you go read the dog food, it has drowned bone meal. Well, where's the fluoride accumulate? It accumulates in the bone. So if you grind the bones of a cow up and feed it to a dog, the dog gets crippled faster. So exactly the same thing happens to humans. Low back pain, lower lumbar spine. And any kind of fluoride can poison you. Um, how you get exposed if you're taking a shower, it goes through your skin. You get uh, like a, a whole glass of water every time you take a shower, even if it's a fairly quick one. Um, this guy uh, uh, is a subsistence farmer in China, and uh, the um, area is so arid and, and tough that uh, you can tell it's not a, you know, a real fancy place he lives in. Um, but they raise corn, and corn will rot if you don't dehydrate it. So they have a little barbecue. They call it a bachi that you can buy them at Home Depot. And they put coal in it that you can pick up off the top of the ground. It's really crappy coal, but you can pick it up. It's free. And then they dry the corn so it'll last for a year, and that's what they eat. That's their subsistence. Well, A, the corn ends up with fluoride in it because who knew fluoride was in coal? Oh, well, that's the other thing that's coming out the chimney besides the mercury is the coal. Almost, And so it ends up with the fluoride in the corn, so he's eating that. And two, he's doing it inside his house because he has only one house, and so he inhales it. And you can see how his legs have turned into ribbons. He hasn't been able to walk since he was 18. And the reason he looks kind of sad is because there is no help for people like that. And if he didn't have friends and relatives that would feed him, he would be very skinny. So the, um, and here's a, um, this is actually a clip from a movie that I made, a documentary on our trip. It's called uh, uh, China's Battle with Crippling Waters. And uh, the guy in the back is Gao. Uh, Dr. Gao is the, uh, uh, the chairman of the uh, uh, medical uh, uh, division of the, of the uh, Department of Endemic Disease Control in Alhan province, which is up by Inner Mongolia. They have high natural fluoride in their drinking water. And the guy in the front is, uh, I think he's 48 or 49. Um, his name's Louis Jidi. 
and uh, Dr. Gao is showing you how Louis's head will not bend sideways. He's got his hand and he's pushing, and pretty soon Louis says, ah, because <laughs> it hurt me. <laughs> and he tries to scratch his head and he gets his hand up about this high, and he can't scratch his head. So I was in a consultant in a, a trailer park in Monterey, and uh, the, one of the questions I would ask everybody in the trailer park, uh, that they lived there, uh, mostly uh, uh, new Americans, and they'd lived there, uh, some of them all their life, and some of them had moved there 15, 20 years ago. And the, uh, the question I asked him is, is, you know, if a bandit came up and pointed a gun at you and said, stick your hands up, how high can you reach up? And the ones that could go like this have what Louis had. It's skeletal fluorosis, soft tissue fluorosis. Your, your shoulders begin to bind up so that you can't move your arms up above your head. And that's what Dr. Gao shows behind Louis is that he, Louis can't reach up and touch his head, and Dr. Yao does and reaches, touches the opposite side of his head because it accumulates in soft tissue first and fills your bones up first. And after your bones are all full and your soft tissues are all hard instead of flexible, like your ligaments and your joints and all that stuff, then it ends up to the point where you get uh, what are called bone spurs. And that's, that's really where the pain starts is because... Bones are supposed to be smooth because muscles move around on them. Well, your body has no use for fluoride. Fluoride has not a nutrient. It's basically a poison. And your body parks it in the bone. In the same place as it parks lead, for example. And so by parking the bone, the bone fills up. And once the bone is all full, the body makes fake bone or extra bone. And so if you ran your hand down a, a, a human femur, it would be smooth as a baby's bottom. But if they're fluoride poisoned, it feels like sandpaper. And so every time they walk or move, the muscle ends up torn a little bit. So th that's why I say that the symptom of fluoride poisoning is pain. And um, the National Academy of Science at one time had an upper tolerable intake of 10 milligrams per day for 10 years. Well, let's just do a little math on that. What if you didn't intend to die at the age of 10? And maybe you'd like to live to be 100. Boy, doesn't that make the math easy? So wouldn't that be the same as one milligram a day for 100 years? And that's exactly what autopsy show, is that we're marching along toward stage four skeletal fluorosis if we're getting 10 milligrams a day for 10 years or one milligram a day for 100 years, is that your bones actually fill up with fluoride, even at the level that they have fluoride in the water of Tucson. Tucson, this is Tulsa. Tucson, too, actually. But it's a daily dose. It's a systemic dose. If you've got good kidneys, you can excrete 50% of it. And we have 14% of the population in the United States do not have good kidneys. And I keep asking this question, but nobody seems to answer it. I said, why is it appropriate to put a chemical in the water supply that injures 14% of the population? I'm sorry. I don't understand. Why is that okay? We have to buy the stuff from China, haul it in, put it in the water, and we say, well, it's good for the kiddies. Well, we'll find out about that. Because who knew fluoride affects brain? They forgot to tell us that in dental school. And what the dental school would say, that's none of your business. Somehow we're supposed to limit ourselves to the oral cavity, and that if what we do injures some other organ, we're supposed to refer. So I like to say dentists can't treat any of the diseases we cause. We can only refer. But there's your relative toxicity. And uh, this is out of, uh, and you'll find on several of my slides here, when I tell you something factual like that, I'll give you the, where it came from. And you can tell it's an old book, and that's because it's in my library. But arsenic is just a hair more toxic than fluoride. And fluoride itself is a lot more toxic than lead. And I'll get into it, but there's a, there's a relationship between fluoride and lead that nobody even knew until a decade or so ago. So if I wanted you to brush your teeth with an arsenic toothpaste, would you think I was stupid? Even if I said it's been shown by thousands and thousands of studies to reduce tooth decay 99%. Here's this arsenic toothpaste. You'd say, hmm, wonder where we went. He went to dental school. Well, you know, 
I see some gray hair in here. You're old enough to remember the lead toothpaste we had. Remember the tubes that rolled up and stay rolled up? Those were lead tubes. And then when the measured the amount of lead in them, it was over 450 parts per million. My goodness, we were brushing our teeth with lead, weren't we? And so, actually, they've shown that lead in children's blood is linked to an increased rate of tooth decay. So, very likely, those toothpaste were linked to an increased rate of tooth decay. But you don't get that from the manufacturers. It doesn't say anything about that on the label, does it? By the way, this may make you, your children stupid and have rotted teeth. So, and the deal on fluoride is, is it, and, and a lot of young people in here will understand this. The old guys, they'll have a lot of trouble. I'll have to draw a picture for them. But there is a, a, a continuum in toxicology that changed. It changed in a thunderclap. And medicine doesn't generally do that. I mean, you know, Dr. Simmelweis said, wash your hands before you deliver a baby after doing an autopsy in 1840. And it wasn't even common practice until after the turn of the century in this country. And they drove Dr. Siemelweiss out of town and died a broken man. But he wasn't wrong. But medicine doesn't change that fast, does it? Well, toxicology used to be that if you had 49.9 parts per million lead in your bloodstream, you were okay. If you had 50, then you were lead toxic. Well, now they think that a baby with two parts per million lead in his bloodstream is at risk, and they will take it out of your home to protect it if it's up to 10. Because you're a bad parent for letting that baby's blood get up to 10. What changed was Herbert Needleman did a study in Wichita, Kansas, showing that minute amounts of lead lowered the intelligence of children, and it changed toxicology. Because the end point for toxicology on lead was death. They didn't care if you were crippled along with bad bones and joints that hurt and anemia because the lead was in the, in the bloodstream. But when Needleman showed it lowered the IQ, then people said, oh, there's another measure of toxicity besides death. So all the time you hear dentists say, well, I haven't seen anybody die because I put a mercury filling in them. Well, nobody died in my chair when I did a topical fluoride treatment. You're looking at the wrong endpoint. It's a very blunt endpoint. And then I like to point out the child that was on his first visit to the dentist that did die from a topical fluoride treatment. Hygienist painted his little teeth with that 15,000 parts per million fluoride and handed him a glass of water. What's a three-year-old do when you hand him a glass of water? They swallow it, right? And she gave him back to his mother. And he threw up and passed out. His mother thought he went to sleep. And he said, you made my baby sick. What did you do? What'd you do? No, we didn't do anything to him. Nothing, nothing. We didn't do anything. Good. He's got the flu. T take him down to the doctor's office in the next building down here. And there she had a long wait. And when the doctor finally heard, listened to the child's heart, he was going into cardiac arrest. They gave him a shot of adrenaline directly into the heart and called 911. And they transported the kid. And while they were trying to pump the fluoride out of his stomach, that he died. At the trial... Both the hygienist and the dentist had testified that they had not realized that fluoride was a poison. Well, none of you people will be able to testify that ever again. However, they won't die in your chair because I'm going to tell you, had they instituted gastric lavage, vomiting, calcium in huge quantities, and started an IV of calcium, could be alive today. He died because the fluoride sucked all the calcium out of his bloodstream and he ran into cardiac arrest. You know, if you know that's the sequelae, take steps to prevent it. Don't stand around with your thumb in your ear. So, so anyway, fluoride and lead both lower your IQ. And where do we get this stuff? And, and the advocates for fluoridation always say, well, these are the Chinese studies. Well, yes, and so it's natural fluoride. So it's not nearly the same as our own unnatural fluoride. But in areas where the, the kids have dental fluorosis, they have lower IQ than the areas that don't have dental fluorosis. And then they have, um, when you look at what happens is you lose all your genius. You see the area above the line? Those are brilliant people that, you know, figure out how to make rockets and, uh, and fix teeth and that sort of stuff. So you end up with a lot of people that can run a broom or... Uh, make a bed, but they don't know how to uh, make a satellite, or 
they don't know how to make a Boeing 747. They are impaired because you have a fluorotic brain. And they've got lots of other studies. Here's one where they had compared high, high and higher fluoride in the water. This is what's missing from this graph, because in that area, that was the lowest level of fluoride they could find, 0.9. That's, that's a little higher than Tulsa today. <laughs> so there's a good chance that if we had 0, 0, we'd have the best IQ possible. But, uh, well, we missed that one. Poor old, poor old Chinese, they don't have that kind of water. And, um, and here's uh, Dr. Thiessen, uh, who's uh, done some work for our academy. Uh, she sat on the National Academies of Science uh, Expert Review. She is a specialist in um, risk assessment. And uh, what she does is she, she basically uh, uh, goes through the toxicolog toxicological reports of various elements and then uh, figures out what you can tolerate um, on a mass scale and have no adverse impact on your health. And this is one of her graphs that uh, with, came out of uh, uh, a Canadian expert panel. Um, and you see that the caries incidence um, remained exactly the same even as the uh, level of fluoride in the water uh, increased. What's interesting about this graph, and I have a few more thrown in here, and the, is that, that that agrees perfectly with all, all the broad-based blinded studies of fluoride in drinking water. There are some studies that even you would laugh at if you took a moment to look at them. Um, like one of the original um, claims that fluoride was beneficial and, and is still often made today before city councils by ignorant dentists who have not done their own due diligence is that the study in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan, was a pivotal study in the in, in discovery of the benefits of systemic fluoride and that it reduced tooth decay 60% of the permanent teeth. And, um, so let me tell you how they started it. In 1945, using Muskegon as a control, they began to add one part per million fluoride to the uh, city of Grand Rapids. At the end of five years, they added fluoride to the control city. So how many permanent teeth does a child have at age five? Come on. How many? Zero. And it, say it loud. Okay. So can you explain to me how they saw a 60% reduction in the permanent tooth decay in five years? You might. Smell a rat. What they did find was a huge increase in dental fluorosis, especially in the minority population in Muskegon. Why, when there are only four cities in the entire United States that have fluoride added to the water supply, did they fluoridate Muskegon? their control city. They destroyed their own experiment after five years. Why did they do that? Because it showed without a question you're harming children. And that would not support the program that they were undertaking, which was to dispose of hydrofluorosic acid. They don't put fluoride in the water supply. They started out and showed signs and Sodium fluoride, yada, yada, same as your toothpaste, yada, yada, yada. And they stopped before the first five years were up because they never intended to put sodium fluoride in the water supply. It's about disposal of hydrofluorosic acid. And it's based upon stuff like this. H. Trinley Dean's 21 cities. Remember that? He surveyed 200. If I can survey 200 people and report on 21, I can show you smoke and makes you live longer. It makes you beautiful, too. And when you throw out your data and give you a biased selection, you can show anything. That's what the graph should look like. It looks like a pump shotgun. The, 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 the statisticians love um, all the fluoride studies because uh, what do they say? Uh, Statistics don't lie, but statisticians do. And so the, I have a friend that teaches a course in statistics in uh, uh, Davis, in California. And uh, he 
says he uses the, all, of the, all of the four I studied. He says all of them are, are manipulating data uh, with, with an intended outcome. And what he likes to do is to see if his students can figure out how they did it. He already knows. So, all right, I want you to examine these studies and tell me uh, whether they're an uh, application of the statistical method you've learned in your class today or a reasonable application. Uh, you, can, you can see a similar application in the Nun study if you want to see a, a way to try to make something disappear. I hate when that happens. So, um, so fluoride causes cancer. Um, National Toxicological Program, the rats had cancer of the lip where they drank 79 parts per million fluoride from the spigot. The dysplasia of the throat, tongue, liver, they had a, a rare form of cancer called a hepatoangioplangioma and uh, the bone, osteosarcoma. And uh, the people who are advocates for adding this chemical to the water supply took that study and changed every single cancer, not one level, but two. So all of the carcinoma in situ of the lip became dysplasias. Um, the uh, hepatoangioplangioma, which is a rare form of liver cancer, became a benign tumor, uh, a, a hepatoma, a very common tumor that occurs in animals. Um, they, they had a little trouble with the osteosarcoma because the osteosarcoma is a very mm, obvious cancer. And um, so what they did is they took the biggest cancer and they said, well, this can't be an osteosarcoma because it's so big the rat would have died. So they threw it out to get it down to equivocal evidence. Well, I had equivocal evidence that uh, lead was lowering the IQ in children. We would take action. But equivocal evidence that fluoride is causing cancer in our society, we sit on our thumbs and say, well, you haven't proven that caused this. And so actually they have. But um, one of the things that dentists often say is, oh, those poor rats, they were so overdosed with fluoride. What's interesting about that study is that if you grind up the rat and look at the fluoride level in the bone, which is, you know, a rat only lives four years. But if you look at the fluoride level of the bone, the rats with bone cancer actually had lower levels of fluoride in their bones than we did. So the rat was technically underdosed. And um, they all had dental fluorosis. 41% of the children today have dental fluorosis. They had skeletal fluorosis uh, in China and, uh, and in Independence, Missouri. Um, hip fractures have gone up steadily since this program began, and that's because uh, what happens uh, both in animals and in human studies, uh, that when you put fluoride in the bone, it loses its tensile strength. You know, the tensile strength is the ability to bend something. Uh, William Virtue will be here later on talk about the ability of things to bend when you're skiing. And uh, the, if you're up and doing some whoosh and swoosh uh, down the mountain with your nice slick boards on the bottom of your feet, you might question the reasonableness of having slick boards on the bottom of your feet at the top of the mountain. But if you were up doing that and you're coming into a turn and you're, you're putting the, the, you're edging into the ice and you got your, got your weight on there, that your bones on your legs will actually bend a little bit. And that sends out a piezoelectric current to your, your, your bone cells. And they say, say we're bending. The next thing is going to happen, we're breaking. So we need to make more bone. And so it increases the strength of the bone because you're lifting weights or skiing or exercising, doing something that makes that bone bend. Well, that's what it, it's supposed to do. But when you add fluoride to the bone, you create a different kind of bone. It's an abnormal bone. You know how they always talk about, oh, the fluoride incorporates in the uh, hydroxy, calcium hydroxyapatite to make a calcium fluoroapatite. Well, it does the same thing in the bone. It makes a calcium fluoroapatite, which is weaker and more prone to fracture. So um, when you actually measure the enamel uh, that has calcium uh, fluoroapatite, it, it makes the enamel weaker. So we were taught a whole bunch of stuff that's simply untrue. You can, you can check the hardness of enamel. I mean, goodness gracious, this is not that difficult. And you've seen it in your dental practice. It's if you've got some child that's got dental fluorosis, you take a, a Joe Dandy sandpaper disc and it goes, sands right off, doesn't it? It's weak. You can prove that to yourself. Just take an explorer and scratch it. It scratches, whereas enamel doesn't. It's considerably weaker. And they've got, you know, they say the gold standard in medicine is case control. Well, we actually have case control studies showing a dose of fluoride causes increase in hip fracture. And uh, they were, because fluoride accumulates in the bone, it makes the bones whiter. So when you take an x-ray of it, you have a white looking bone and they say, oh, oh good, you don't have osteoporosis. Well, no, you have osteofluorosis. And 
So what they did is they say, well, you know, obviously we need to give people a dose of fluoride, and that will harden their bones. And so uh, they uh, had a 15 milligram a day dose, which is a pretty good sized dose. But they had to discontinue the study after two years because the, all of the hip fractures occurred in the people taking the, the fluoride, and none in the control. So anyway, um, mercury damages the thyroid, but interestingly enough, so does fluoride. And uh, and I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, there's a I would invite anybody, really, that, that would like a copy of the most recent National Academies of Science uh, review. And I've read it twice. It's, it's, it's 497 pages, and it's, a, it's the first good review of fluoride um, that's occurred from the government in the, in the last 50 years. And, uh, but I have it in PDF form, and I, I really can't figure out how I can take it a sheet of paper and scan it in my little scanner and it comes out as, you know, 10 megabytes and they got a 497 page document that's, that's only 15 megabytes, but I, I mean, anyway, I'll email it to you. But um, one of the things that the National Academy of Science reported out was that thyroid suppression occurs at doses. Now, here's a term that most dentists don't get exposed to. It's called dose. It's not a little bitty bit or the abrascosh. That's a bartender. I just want a splash of vermouth. It's a dose. And dose is always weight for weight. Milligrams per kilogram, ounces per pound. It's not weight per volume, not one part per million. That's a concentration. Dose is, I weigh 200. What's my dose? 100 kilograms? Give me 10, I get 10 milligrams for 100 kilograms makes it 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, right? Well, the dose that damages the thyroid is 0 0.01 if the child is iodine deficient. But even if they aren't iodine deficient, it's 0 0.03. So you think about that as like money. So it's written like a penny will damage a child with a, a thyroid, a thy with, with normal healthy thyroid, but they're deficient in iodine. So a penny's worth of fluoride will damage that child. If they're a normal iodine child, three cents will damage that child. Thyroid suppression. So what happens when you damage the child's thyroid? They end up um, stupid and obese. You know, th thyroid, damaged thyroid. When I was in school, the hypothyroidism was called cretinism. You know what a cretin is? Not somebody you want to hang out with. They're cretins. So they changed the term to thyroid suppression. The um, gastric upset, and I had a wonderful chance to share my tremendous knowledge of toxicology with one of the world's leading toxicologists, is, uh, Professor Boyd Haley. And that uh, he and I were invited to, to uh, refute the claims of the German Department of Health that the mercury was safe in uh, 1994, and, and I wrote a little article called Airplanes, Trains, Buses, and Speeding Cars, um, that we all practicing dentists and professors sped over to Germany on Wednesday afternoon and arrived no later than Friday morning to open a conference, and like just like here. I wonder where we got that idea. Anyway, so at Offenhausen, and, uh, and so we had 12 people that thought mercury was probably not a good idea, and we had 12 people that thought mercury was a really good idea, and Mike Zip was the keynote speaker, and we had two peer reviewers, uh, uh, Gerhard Schrauser and, uh, and Lars Schreiber. And so we blew their socks off and won the day and, and got up at, actually before dawn and got on the bus. They were taking us back to Frankfurt, and I was sharing a seat with Boyd, and he's sitting there groaning and moaning and uh, complaining about his uh, gastric upset. And uh, he reaches in his pocket and pulls out a package of Tums. And I said, oh, God, where's Alan Funt with the camera? An Alzheimer's researcher taking little tablets of aluminum. Oh, my God, what's going on here? <laughs> he said, oh, I got this terrible burn in my stomach. And I had to take some Tums. And I said, oh, uh, did you bring your American toothpaste with you? And he said, well, uh, uh, Colgate. <laughs> and I said, well, you're the chemist. What happens uh, when you put, uh, you know, sodium monofluorophosphate in with hydrochloric acid. He said, well, you got hydrogen fluoride. And I said, well, you better put some aluminum on that to get some aluminum fluoride. So uh, quit hurting you. 
So anyway, um, he was so nice to me. The next time I saw him at the, an IMT conference in Tucson, he came powering across the room and plumping my hand. And he says, Kennedy, you saved my life. He said, uh, he said uh, both my wife and I, his wife's a redhead, and uh, so is Boyd, and both my wife and I have had gastric upset for years. But when we threw out that fluoridated toothpaste, we quit having problems. He said, you know, you know how wives don't ever listen to you? He said, well, Sandy wouldn't throw the toothpaste out, but she would brush her teeth, and then she would stop and rinse out. And he said that we were totally free from gastric upset for almost a, a six months. And then on the way to work the other day, she made me pull into a 7-Eleven so she could buy another box of Tums to try to make her gastric upset go away. And she, he said, I thought that, that was over with. I thought you... I thought you, you know, you would solve that problem. And she said, well, I was brushing my teeth this morning and the phone rang and, and I, I just spit out and ran to the phone. He said, well, let's get some thumbs on there. So then she threw out her fluoridated toothpaste. And neurological impairment is uh, what suffers the dentist throughout promoting fluoride or something neurologically impaired. The, um, so if you really wanted to stop tooth decay. And then there's, there's a question, because I, I still have my senior dental student over here who was angry that they figured out how to stop dental, dental disease. But I don't think we're that kind of profession. We're not the kind of, <laughs> there was the guy that used to pack amalgam and then he'd put a piece of dental floss at the bottom and then he'd pack the amalgam and then he'd pull the dental floss out. Because I guess the business wasn't good enough, so he'd have to leave a little opening so that the tooth decay would get back in. He, he showed one of the, the dental students how to do that when, when we did the visitations at the offices. So I don't think that's particularly appropriate behavior, but the, you know, we, you got to put up with people like that. But we don't have to run our profession like we're all that kind of person, are we? Here's a lady. Dr. Lopez is a physician, and she got tired of seeing babies with rotted teeth, baby bottle tooth decay. And if you've ever seen that, it, it just breaks your heart. You know, here's a rug rat that doesn't know anything about anything, and they, all their teeth are rotted off at the gum line. The worst case I ever saw was from orange juice. A little sugar and acid there. And, uh, but in, uh, she's in Puerto Rico, and the, the Puerto Rican ladies think it's nice to give a baby what they call sweet milk, is you put a tablespoon of sugar in milk, and that's their, uh, their nighttime bottle or their daytime bottle or their noon bottle or whatever. It's called sweet milk. And so that gets a really nice crop of streptococcus mutans growing. So it rots their little baby teeth out pretty bad, and Dr. Lopez got tired of seeing this. So she basically worked out a, a, a very simple program that she had her nurse uh, uh, dip a Q-tip in the povidone iodine. And you know how a child, when they're, she, she selected 100 children that were at risk. They were children whose mothers were giving them sweet milk. So you could not find a worse group of children to work with. And... What do you have in, in the doctor's office? Remember when you cut your finger, you had, they, they painted it with that orange stuff? Well, that's, that's povidone iodine. It's iodine with an ammonia group on the end of it. So it looks like food to a bacterium. On, the, on one end is an NH3, ammonia. Bacteria eat by dissolving you and absorbing protein. So when they see that NH3, the ammonia group, they think they got an amino acid. Oh, I've got food. And so it's kind of like a hand grenade that's got a beautiful bow and a gift wrap on it. Oh, thank you! And they absorb the iodine and that kills them. So when you put povidone iodine on skin, skin is hard to sterilize, but you know, if you were going to have an operation or something like that, you go in there and they paint that, and then they come back a minute and they paint it again, and then they take a knife and cut it in, they've killed all the bugs on your skin. How'd they do that? Well, povidone iodine. Well, so what she did, she had her nurse take a Q-tip and you know, the kids, that when they're one years old, they look like a rabbit, and they get two, two upper front teeth and two lower front teeth. And so at the rabbit phase, she would take a Q-tip and go, dab, dab, see you in 60 days. Dab, dab, see you in 60 days. They didn't brush their teeth every day. They dab the teeth six times a year. Is there a mother in this room that could not bring herself to dab the teeth six times a year? And what'd she get for that? 91% reduction in tooth decay. Why aren't we all doing that? And I would switch the iodine from povidone, which is the kind that kills germs on skin, to the kind you're supposed to eat, is Lugol's. Potassium iodine and iodide, 50-50. And that's a nutrient form. Not quite as aggressive about bacteria, but heck, we could probably do it seven 
times a year, you think? Even teach mommy to do it, huh? 91%. Cavity free compared to less than half of them. Or not half of them. And she concluded these indicate that the topical antimicrobial therapy increases disease free survival. Isn't that an interesting concept? Antimicrobial therapy. So I made the mistake one time. We'll talk that later. I mean, <laughs> I made the mistake, write it down, write it down so you don't forget. The, I made the mistake one time of, of mentioning uh, that the only reason that uh, the promoters of fluoride uh, can show any benefit is because the fluoride kills the germs. And uh, an old guy uh, in California who's made his living promoting for fluoride for 50 years uh, mumbles out, uh, this is in Santa Monica, he says, well, well, fluoride's not antimicrobial. It, 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 it inhibits the respiration. It, it doesn't. It's not particularly lethal to the bacteria. Well, you know, I'd rather kill the little germs than just choke them. So, so it doesn't even kill the germs. You hear this guy? It doesn't even kill the germs. It's not even good at antimicrobial. You can't use it for antimicrobial therapy. You've got to use something like soap or iodine. And there is the bottom line. Is it? Everybody, but everybody knows that funny looking spotted teeth are not attractive. California determined in 1968 that having funny looking spotted teeth was an adverse health effect. Because the other children would taunt them and bully them because they had spotted teeth. That I am in a, an exchange of letters between the New York Times and myself who said, Experts at the National Academies of Science have reported that dental porosis is barely visible. No, that's the advocates for fluoridation at the Center for Disease Control, the National Academy of Science, said it's an adverse health effect. And I said it's not appropriate for newspapers to report false information using the scam of attribution by attributing it to somebody else when it's a verifiable fact what the National Academies of Science have said. And so I sent him a copy of the National Academy of Science report and referred him to the page. And he said, well, you know, there's still the, the uh, um, it's a quote. And I said, well, if I said that the moon is made out of green cheese, wouldn't you want to call up somebody and say, have you ever heard that the moon's made out of green cheese? Particularly the person that went to the moon, maybe? Did you find green cheese when you were up there? I said, you know, newspapers have a, a greater obligation because you're reporting what you're saying as fact. So this, according to the, to the uh, New York Times, is barely visible. This is a, a young lady from my practice, and, and I'm, many of you have heard this story before, but my sister-in-law, who never believed me, likes to point out that uh, at one point in my early dental training that I prescribed prescription fluoride for her children. And I said, check and see if there's fluoride in the water of San Leandro. But if there isn't, then here's some nice little tablets of poison for your children. And um, she never got it filled because there is fluoride in the water of San Leandro. Um, so we all have to go through our, our, our transitions. Uh, I, I was in the Navy. I put in 150 uh, fillings a day. And then, you know, I probably have taken an equal number out in the last year. So my karma is neutral. Right there in the middle. But uh, nice little girl, she's, I think, 14 at this point. And I said to her, I said, uh, oh, I see you got a little too much fluoride when you were a small child. And she said, don't you remember what you told my mother? And the sweat comes out of my forehead because I could have written her a prescription for fluoride. <laughs> and I said, no, what did I say to your mom? She asked her if you'd give her a baby's tablets of poison. And I said, oh, how clever of me. And so, so she... She stopped giving her uh, little baby's tablets of poison at, uh, at age three for this young lady. And uh, you can see how much of the tooth is formed by age three. If I can make this thing work, there it goes. But she stopped right there. Does that look barely visible to you? Uh, let me tell you how to classify dental fluorosis. If this tooth has damage down to there, 
This tooth has damage up to there, and that one up to there, visible. But since this is less than 25% of the tooth, so they take two teeth. If it's just one tooth, if one tooth is perfect and one tooth is damaged, that's questionable. If it's two teeth, they take the lesser of the most severely damaged teeth. Does that sound like cheating to you? That's, that's Dean, same guy that had the funny graph earlier. So if 25% of the second most damaged tooth is clearly fluorotic, too much fluoride, then that's called very mild. If half of the second most damaged tooth is visibly damaged, it's called mild. And if the entire, if two teeth are entirely spotted with dental fluorosis, that's called moderate. So the example I give to people is that if I had a key and I saw your new BMW sitting out in the parking lot and I took my key and I ripped up and down the fender a little while and you said, geez, what are you doing? You're getting damaged. I said, Questionable. Just one fender. So here's some more um, very mild. And, and nowhere does the patient agree with this, and that's what I pointed out to the New York Times, is that in the National Academy of Science report, they acknowledge a survey of people with dental fluorosis, and the, by far and away the vast majority of them found this objectionable. And one of the surveys actually appeared in the Journal of the American Dental Association. So when they go around saying, oh, People don't mind having brown spots on their teeth. That's why we have the bleaching centers on the corner. So what's the largest growth industry in dentistry? Cosmetic dentistry. So, but even more important, I want you to understand how that lesion got there, because this is the key, is that that lesion got there because like the old fluoride promoter in California said, it inhibits the respiration, the ability of the bacteria to breathe. Well, what's interesting about fluoride is it inhibits every enzyme known to mankind. Duh. Aren't we just a pile of proteins and enzymes, and that's what makes us do stuff? Without our enzymes, we would not survive. If you make a wine and you get it up to the port where the alcohol is just exactly what they'll let you sell in Oklahoma and you want to stop it, how do you make it stop making more alcohol? fluoride in there stops the alcohol production in the wines. One of the reasons you find fluoride in lots of wines. So it inhibits every enzyme known to mankind, and we can see it in the teeth. But that's not the only enzyme it inhibited. It inhibited enzymes making brain. It inhibited enzymes making muscle. It inhibited enzymes making bone. It inhibited every enzyme in that child's body. So what you're seeing is if you can see funny looking spots on the kid's teeth, you have damaged their entire physiology and you can see it in their teeth. Dental fluorosis is the first outward visible sign of fluoride overdose in children. Memorize that because it's important. Many people will try to make it appear as we're claiming tooth decay is the problem. No. Dental fluorosis is the first outward visible sign of fluoride overdose. Now remember back to the word dose, that that child received a dose of fluoride, and they claim it's 0 .05, like a nickel, is the dose of fluoride that supposedly causes that. And you may see it at lower levels if the child is deficient or concurrently exposed to lead, because lead in fluoride causes more dental fluorosis. So. Okay, what's the definition of dental fluorosis? Hello? Hello? What's, what's the definition of dental fluorosis? Shout it out if you know. No. You lose, Bill. <laughs> okay. I'll go back. Dental fluorosis is the first outward visible sign of fluoride overdose in children. There's, there's a lot in that sentence. Dental fluorosis, funny looking spotted teeth. 
is the first outward visible sign. You can't, you can't see the joints and the muscles, but it's the outward visible sign of an excess dose of fluoride in children. It doesn't occur in adults. The tooth has to be being formed. And so Colgate's paid out big money to this little kid who had dental fluorosis because he ate the toothpaste. How many children eat the toothpaste? 10,000 calls a year to the poison control centers from children who made ill by swallowed toothpaste. In 1998, the Center for Disease Control acknowledged that there probably is excess exposure. And what they're talking about in 1998 is a study that was done in 1987. So they got right on it. Oh, we got a problem here. Let's get right on that. And um, recent national survey, recent 1987, hmm, recent, and uh, this is what they're saying. Bleaching can't fix it. Dentists use expensive veneers to cover it up. So um, this is their recent national survey um, that in areas of, uh, and this is using that classification system where you have to have two teeth damage. Otherwise, you know, we don't count that scratch on your vendor. <laughs> Forget that. It's questionable. So the... 14% of people live in a community that has no natural fluoride or less than, less than this, is a, this is their scale here, uh, less than 0.3 parts per million. My minimum risk level for fluoride in the water for an adult is about 0.1, and for a baby it should be 0.05 or, or even less, 0.01. So these are overdosed by my standards, but most of the water supplies in this country don't comply with my standards. You have to buy, you have to buy the water or have it made. To, to get down to that standard. But, you know, in the process of getting there, you also get rid of the arsenic. So they forgot to tell you about that. There's a real problem that's got the arsenic. So, so anyway, there's your, uh, there's your survey. 14% of the kids in, in non fluoridated communities, 22% uh, uh, of the kids in, in areas that have moderate uh, amount of fluoride in the water and at the optimal level. You have to use that term. If you're going to get an article published in the Journal of the American Dollar Association, you have to use the word optimum several times. I, 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 I'm, I'm speculating on that. I, I, don't ha I haven't ever tried to publish an article in the journal, but I've noticed that if, even if they write an article about hip fracture or something like that, they talk about optimum level of fluoride in the water. Well, what's the optimum level of fluoride in the water? Zero. Unless you want to have dental fluorosis. So. And so the, um, that's what happens when you do that. Um, I don't have a clock here, and I don't know what time it is. 9.30? Jeff, would you tell me, uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, you want to take a break about 10 or 10, 1030? Let's, about, let's take a break about 10, 15. And so, Jeff, if you'll give me a 15-minute countdown. for, I'm going to have Jeff Green in the back is a good friend of mine, my management consultant, the reason I can retire at such an early age, um, and uh, a brilliant uh, uh, campaigner for safe water. And, um, and I'm going to have him come up and give you kind of a summary of some of the legal um, things that we've, we've gone through uh, uh, on this issue and uh, um, how uh, some of the things you can do in your own communities that might uh, act not only enhance your practice, but enhance your community. So it's 9.30 now, so give me a, give me a, oh, uh, 10 minutes to, to shut down time, will you? Two, ten, ten, 10 before 10, two, two, two hands, I can count the fingers. So um, toothpaste. Should have had a warning on it uh, in 1960 when they came out with it, but uh, didn't. And then, uh, oh, 30 years later, we set up a thing called Poison Control Center. And the phone was ringing off the hook. My little kids were puking and sick and all this other stuff. And they finally figured out they were getting 10,000 calls a year to the, the states that had poison control centers. Only half the states had them, so that's roughly half the country. 10,000 calls a year to children made ill by swallow toothpaste or like Sandy uh, Haley, you know, just a little re residue in their mouth that they didn't spit out quite well enough. You know, they did studies on toothpaste and they, and they, they gave, put a, a measured amount of fluoride on the toothbrush and they had a gob of children go brush and then spit out into the cup. And then they measured how much fluoride came back out. Is it some children no fluoride came back out. And these are kids that are told to spit it out. You know, some of them would be like, you know, half of it. I think on average it was like 42% of it came back. So when you put something on the toothbrush, you're putting it in.
inside the tub. I'm sorry, that's how that works. And so, if I had the arsenic toothpaste and I said, oh, don't swallow it, you say, oh, for God's sake, don't swallow it. That's, please don't swallow it. So, if you put a milligram on the tooth, brush and swallow it, they say call the Poison Control Center. Keep out of reach of children. Same warning goes on your 38 caliber pistol that's got bullets in it. Keep out of reach of children. In case of accidental overdose, seek professional assistance or contact the Poison Control Center immediately. Some of them say seek, and they, uh, they basically have been trying to tweak this. This is, the, this is the required warning. It's been on the tube since 1997. I have bought more tubes of fluoridated toothpaste just so I can show people that warning <laughs> since 1997 than I did in the previous two decades. So, um, there, That's not the only thing wrong with toothpaste. Um, the, uh, um, some of the uh, disinfectants in toothpaste um, lead to uh, lesions in the mouth called aptostomatitis and uh, herpes. Um, if your toothpaste foams, it's probably got sodium lauryl sulfate in it. I think that's the next slide. Um, Oh, this is, this is the one from the, uh, um, the uh, coliforms and the uh, cancer alert. And uh, soap, foaming ingredients make you break out with herpes or uh, aptostomatitis, a very pleasant, pleasant experience, especially if you're trying to get a date. Um, oh, it's not contagious. <laughs> so, so. You know what people say? Well, what, what do you use to brush with? I, if you if you can get it in the kitchen, and put it in the food, and the kids don't die, you can brush with that. Or you can use saliva, because God, in their infinite wisdom, put every single mineral your tooth needs in saliva. And the trouble is scum on your teeth. So knock the scum off your teeth, okay? It's not that hard. So this dosage schedule changed changed in in the 90, 1995. And the reason is that they found that you could cause uh, lots of dental porosis in the little kid. His name's David, by the way. The, uh, not my child, but uh, the, uh, the cutie pie. And uh, so no fluoride exposure to children in the prescription form. So when you put fluoride in the tap water, you're giving babies on the bottle. Say mom was a hygienist and had to go back to work. Well, what's the kid going to eat? Well... Granny's going to make him up some formula with the tap water. So you dose in that child. Now let's do the math. What's the optimum level of fluoride according to the American Dollar Association? I just showed you. In the water. The word you have to use, the fluoride in the water, they claim that 0.7 to 1.2 is the optimum dose. Let's just average it to one so the math is easy. What do you say? Okay. And so he's kind of a bouncing baby boy. So it's probably about four kilograms. So we can divide four into one and what we get. If we took a dollar and divided it into four pieces, what do we have? A quarter of a dollar. And that's written 0.25. Now, remember, we were talking about depressing the thyroid with a penning's worth. That would be 0 0.01. Or if you had adequate iodine, that would be 0 0.03. So we know that harm occurs if you give that child three cents worth of fluoride. And when you put the chemical in the water supply, you're giving them 25 cents worth. You know, if I went to the school and I had a bunch of candies that had a little lead in them and I went around giving the kiddies a bunch of candy at a, at a level that would cause harm to the children, they'd arrest me. Why don't they arrest the dentist? They're claiming because they have the power of the United States government behind them. Ah, there's a reason for that. Did you know that fluoride is an element essential for the national security? And you know there's no mechanism to remove it from the list? Uranium's there too. But you can't take it off the list. We don't make nuclear bombs anymore. We get enough to destroy the earth about 160 times. So we quit using it was the secret element in how to make the bomb. That's why they had to get rid of the fluoride, because it's a waste product of making nuclear weapons. Because they don't use fluoride. They use silicon fluoride to fluoridate the water supply. So anyway, the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Dental Association, and every medical association in the world says no fluoride to babies. And that's what we're doing in our country. 
and we're wondering why the kids can't learn to read and write. We're wondering why they have so much trouble in school and their behavior problems are just mounting up terribly. Maybe we're giving them something they shouldn't have. Because if you ask, if you're poisoning the mother nearly to death with fluoride, her breast milk is 0 0.05 and they have adequate levels of iodine. Even if the mother is suffering from tremendous iodine deficiency, her breast will scavenge iodine from all of the cells of her body and give it to the baby. Because God knows what needs the food. It's not mom. The next generation. Otherwise, you don't survive on the planet. And there's gobs of research showing that the kids are smarter if you breastfeed them than if you tap water feed them. Oh, and he, this is kind of a fuzzy slide, but of all the 74 studies used for a meta-analysis, a 24% decrease in increment of decay based only on looking at the teeth rather than the number of teeth. That there's lots of studies. You know, I, you know, the first outward visible sign of fluoride overdose, you know what the other one is? Delayed eruption of teeth. Ah, so what mother thinks it's good for the, her child to be slow? My child is half as fast as yours. I give them fluoride, and their teeth come in almost a year late. And the dentists know this. These people doing the study know this because they don't adjust for the number of teeth in the mouth. What kind of study of tooth decay says all children are the same age, but regardless of the number of teeth in the mouth? So if you got, you know, 20 baby teeth and no permanent teeth, obviously you're not going to have any permanent tooth decay, right? So if you delay the permanent tooth coming in by six months to a year, you're going to show a decrease in the amount of tooth decay. That's what they're basing that. That's that 24%. And this is a ling lady from uh, San Francisco who um, drank fluoridated tap water when she was a child. She's Chinese, it's ethnic origin. And dad wanted a boy. And so she has uh, five sisters. And um, he only shoots girls. And uh, what can I say? And, uh, but anyway, the, as soon as her younger sister, her first sister was born, they moved out of San Francisco to um, a house in the country <laughs> that's for that, with, on a well. And uh, there's no fluoride in the water. And none of her five sisters have any dental fluorosis. And uh, my detractors would say, oh, well, that's, that's just the flash from the camera. That's, that's, that's just what, that, actually it's not. It's the light in the room that's doing that. And, but since she's a model, the, her photographer said that she had to go get her teeth fixed if she was going to make it as a model. She has a degree in, from San Diego State, and so she came in to get her teeth beautified so she could be on magazines. And um, so th this, is, this is the stuff that is not visible, but it's what children get, according to the American Dental Association article by Levi in 1995, is that infants receiving substantial quantities of formula generally should not use powder or liquid concentrate if the water fluoride levels are near optimal. Would it be optimal if we made spots with optimal? Optimal for spotting. Optimal spotting water. And since the water fluoride alone might exceed the total daily recommended levels, which are, for an infant, I'll give you a clue, you guys are really asleep today. The, uh, and then in November 9th, the uh, 2006, the uh, ADA sent an email, they call it an egram, to all of their members. And I didn't get one because um, I uh, no longer a member, but I was for 30 years. And they, uh, they said, if you want to avoid dental fluorosis, why would you not want to avoid dental fluorosis? Maybe you're going to be a dentist and you could have laminates on your teeth for free or something. Be the first guinea pig in dental school to have laminates done by other students. <laughs> Having been a dental student, I know how that might turn out. And uh, infants who get most of their nutrition from formula in the first 12 months use ready-to-feed formula. You know why ready-to-feed formula? Let's see if I can get the year right. In 1979, the Food and Drug Administration made all of the fluoride, all of the manufacturers of baby formula, ready-to-feed formula, moved their facilities out of fluoridated communities because there was too much fluoride in it. So 
Here they are saying, use the ready-to-feed formula because the FDA made them take it out. Well, who's making them put it in the powdered formula? Do you know the difference in cost? If you're a poor person, you buy the powdered formula. So we're basically causing dental fluorosis in minority populations because wealthy women stay home and breastfeed the kids or buy ready-to-feed formula. Water that's labeled purified, demineralized, deionized, distilled, reverse osmosis, filtered water. And what's interesting about that is I have a fluoride tester. Everybody should get a fluoride tester. After you get your mercury tester, go get a fluoride tester because they're only 400 bucks. And they're this, the cat's meow. You can go into a restaurant and they say, oh, we have filtered water. Well, just give me a little bit. I'll test it. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'll care for that. They said, what'd you do there? I just measured the fluoride level in it. And it's the same as the tap water. They said, well, we filter it. Yeah, well, what do you filter it through? Carbon? Fluoride doesn't stick to carbon. You have to run it through aluminum. Oh, great. Now I can have aluminum water for dinner. So, DINS, we measured water at Whole Foods, 0.7. Trader Joe's, 0.7. Costco, 0.7. Arrowhead, 0.7. Fuji, 1. You know, there's gobs of fluoride in our bottled water. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to use bottled water. Because there's gobs of fluoride, and we've got food labels on our water. So they tell you how much fat there is in there. I've never seen fat in water. Doesn't it make the bottle look kind of bad? Float on top? But that's what your bottle formula, your, your water formula. So we have a gob of bumper stickers, and it's, um, it's, got, my, uh, got, it's got my phone number on it. And, uh, on the real one, and uh, I hardly get any calls. But uh, I do occasionally get a call from uh, somebody who says, I saw this sticker on the car and it said, Flora, it's bad for my baby. And I said, using, are they on a bottle? And yeah. Well, it says you can't use the tap water. That's why there's a picture of a faucet there. And they're shocked. But it's the truth. I don't know why that's okay. Fluoridation does not reduce tooth decay. And you have to memorize this one, too. Okay, write this down. There are no broad-based blinded studies of animals or humans that has ever found a significant difference in permanent tooth decay rates from the addition of one part per million fluoride to the public drinking water. Okay? There's lots of qualifiers in that statement. Broad-based blinded. You can do a study of Cincinnati versus Paducah. That's not a broad-based. That's two rats. Nobody's looking at two rat studies. So it's got to be broad-based. You need, you know, 30, 40,000 children. You have to blind the investigators. Dentists are biased. All investigators are biased, for that matter. And so you've got to blind them so they don't know where the kid came from so they can't have their subconscious bias come up with the answer. Broad-based blinded. Animals or humans, well, that's pretty self-explanatory, has ever found a significant. Now, significant is the key word here. Significant means you might find a difference. And then it might not be significant because, you know, the numbers vary. You know, some kids have cavities, some don't. And for the addition of one part per million fluoride, you can show a slight difference if the fluoride in the water is natural. But it's more correlated to the boron in the water than the fluoride. So is it the fluoride or is it the boron? And who's saying we should add boron to the water? Nobody I know. But hard water versus soft water, you can show a difference. So, again, that statement is, there are no broad-based blinded studies of animals or humans that's ever found a significant reduction in tooth decay from the addition of one part per million fluoride to the public drinking water. Pretty startling, isn't it? It's a lot different than what you hear when you go to a city council meeting and all the dentists go up and say there's thousands. I heard in a debate, I think uh, Dave Reggiani was talking against Michael Weasley, and M Michael Weasley said there were 30,000 studies. But I got tape of Mike saying there were 3,000 studies. And I got tape of Mike saying there are 13,000 studies. He knows he's got the three right, but he doesn't really. I mean, how can it vary between three and 30? Come on, Mike. You're making that number up. Show me one broad-based blinded studies of animals or humans that's ever found a significant reduction in tooth decay from the addition of one part per million fluoride to the public drinking water. It doesn't exist. Here's 
the largest study ever done in the United States. Can you tell me which line represents the children that have the dental floor, the, floor, the optimum level of fluoride in their drinking water? Kind of hard to see, isn't it? That's because there's no significant difference in those three lines. 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and 1. And that was done, it was funded by, and $11 million by the National Institute of Dental Research. And we now know why. Published in the Journal of the American Dental Association, cover story, the, the level of fluoride incorporated into the dental mineral by systemic ingestion is insufficient to play a significant role in caries prevention. This is tooth decay worldwide. Can you tell me which countries add fluoride to their public water supply? No, you can't. Because there's no significant difference in caries worldwide, regardless of the addition of fluoride to the public water supply. I don't know what that is. Oh, now they claim fluoride, anti-caries effects are entirely topical. Aha, aha. Oh, it's like sunblock. So we need to drink it, put it in the water because somebody got sunburned in San Diego last year. Oh, okay. So entirely topical. What does that mean to you? Who says that kind of stuff? And this is the New York Times guy again. He said, well, I know there's opinions on the other side. I, we're not discussing it. I said, this isn't an opinion. This is, this is what the advocates are saying. And we agree with them. There's no controversy. If it works at all, it works topically. So that means there's no reason to have it in the water. Oh, well, you might drink some water and splash on your teeth, and it would kill any germs that would be around there. Well, oh, it doesn't. It just inhibits them. So as soon as they quit drinking the water, it goes right away. So uh, there are only two applications, fluoride varnishes and carries high active carries individuals and fluoride-based interventions. You can, and the evidence is fair, that fluoride varnish, anybody have any idea how high fluoride is in there? 50,000 parts per million fluoride varnish. Now, remember the rats that had the 79 parts per million had to get the cancer of the lip because they had to go get a little water? Do you think some children in the practices that are using varnish might have cancer of their cheek at some later time where the hygienist slops that stuff around on the tooth? How are you going to keep the cheek? He says, don't touch the soft tissue with it. Well, of course not. Griffin Cole found out that the, there is no FDA approval for that varnish. Huh. So you hear how it is to get stuff approved? Well, the dentist don't bother. They just put it in and sell it. There's no approval been submitted. They don't care. This is the memorandum. I've got a documentary that we're finishing up, and the memorandum plays a key role in this. Bill Marcus has won two whistleblower lawsuits in Washington, D.C., against the EPA, he says fluoride is a carcinogen. They tried to fire him. They witness tampered. They shredded documents. They forged documents and lost. Paid him punitive damages. And then they did the same thing again. He sued him again. He won again. No one at the EPA has been punished for gross unlawful behavior. And people who are deficient in iodine and have bad kidneys and uh, cardiovascular disease are what we call vulnerable subsets. And if you're deficient in calcium, magnesium, again, that's a vulnerable subset. And there's huge amounts of fluoride in everything, including permissible levels on fruits and vegetables, 180, and brush your teeth with lettuce, that's a good idea. And then they regulate the potato so that the inside is two parts per million. The outside can be 22. Raisins can be 55. How do you get the fluoride out of the tomato paste? You can't wash it out. And that means it's in everything that the water that with fluoride touches. It's high in grape juice because of the pesticides. It's high in Gerber's tender harvest, which is their organic chicken, because the deboning process, they put a little bone in the, in the baby food. It's high in your wines because of the planes that have two wings. Yeah. It's high in the dog food because of the ground bone meal. It's not an FDA approved drug. And I'm going to ask Jeff Green to come up and talk about what we're doing to try to assert our rights as citizens of this country. Jeff, come on.
Well, isn't it about time? I think you've got a couple things to say, don't you? I want to introduce you to my friend Jeff Green. Jeff and I have known each other for more than 30 years, and um, Jeff loves horses, and uh, he hates to see him poison his fluoride. But even more than that, he loves his country. And so what he's devoted his last, the last 15 years of his life to is promoting safe water, and that he will talk to you a little bit about the strategy that we've used or he's used to promote safe water in this country. And I think this is on. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, buddy.
you know, the health service is what is driving all this. It's not the dental, despite the fact that American Dental Association plays a large role. It's the U.S. Public Health Service with a county health uh, um, you know, officer in every county and every state that basically is projecting this. There are no local decisions to Florida. It's all orchestrated. It's all the same words. David Kennedy and the rest of the people work on it, but I can tell you everything they're going to say and exactly what you can do about part In our attempt to be able to fight with it because we're in a hurry, they put out 15 lies in an op-ed piece. And normally, if you're still at the early stages of being angry, you fire off a letter responding to 15 problems, expecting that somebody can read it or understand it. And it would take you 10 times as many pages to, you know, basically respond to all that. And so there's an easier and a simpler way. So I'd like to offer you a couple of things before I finish that you could be doing. One of them is, is that one of the things that the, the uh, program of fluoridation, the selling of fluoridation, basically uh, wants to conceal. Because they realize as long as it's concealed that you have a difficulty in any message that you try to put out. And the first one is, is obviously, is that they have projected that in order for you to reduce tooth decay, people have to have access to more fluoride. So David put some of the items up here, but I, the more you learn about, you know, the issue of fluoridation, sometimes we gloss over the things that are the most effective. So one of them is to recognize that right now, not one of you probably can tell your patients how to manage fluoride exposure. Anybody have, anybody even have a fact sheet that you give to a patient to let them know how they can manage fluoride exposure? Probably zero. Okay. 
Second part of this that I would say to you, so one, if you have interest in that and you want some guidance on it, then call me on my telephone number or email me and I'll help you walk you through it, guide you through it so that it's a really simple, simple process. But if you're not even telling your own patients that your only exposure, even if we didn't fluoridate it anymore, you still got to worry about how much fluoride you're getting right now. Tea can be 8 milligrams in one cup of tea. Not 8 parts per million, but 8 milligrams. Okay, knowing that it's on, as you mentioned before, mechanically boned chickens and meats and processed foods, knowing that he showed you a picture of your peas being at 10 parts per million and shredded wheat, well, that's not exactly the water. Yeah, but it's pesticide on the grain, then it's evaporated, and then you have the water that's there too. So how come the fruit loops is only 2.6? Hardly any grains. There's not as much pesticide residue on there. So the point is, we actually have documents that we can send you that you can use for yourself. But you can actually go out and stimulate the whole community and learn more about it because that is one of the things they don't want people to know that it's all around. The second thing is the nature of fluoride where you can see all the reasons that fluoride is used for, for different things. Once people learn what fluoride is used for, all around you, and I don't mean just Prozac and Zoloft and all your psychotropic drugs, but how many of your patients know that if you were to do general anesthesia that you'd be using uh, Cerethane and it's going to be four molecules of fluorine and two of bromine and one of iodine. You know, how many people know that that's part of that? The rohypnol, the date rape drug, basically, that the, your, your enterograde amnesia is coming from the fluoride. So, you know, there's lots of things that you can put out there that are not about trying to paint a picture as the rest of the dentist or the rest of the world will be bad, but you can provide it in a way that people will pass that message on and they can go further than if you just took a position that was anti. The last thing I'm going to relate to is, has, has to do with the fact that the uh, but basically, instead of you responding to everybody and trying to fight all the time with them, recognize that the weakness of all of this is, is that all the endorsements are for the public policy and fluoridation, and none of them are for the product. So you have someone who's put in all these 10, 15 different reasons why it's the greatest thing in the world and why everybody that's supposed to fluoride is wacko. You know, you just don't respond to all that stuff. Why? Cut to the core. Cash with, with your kind of connections and as much knowledge as you have, can you please send me just one toxicological study on the continued use of the actual substance because of the water. And if you want wording, call me. I'll send it to you by email so you can see what it is because you need to qualify it enough that you don't just have them walking around you. But that's all it requires. Because this one individual may, unfortunately, there are an awful lot of dentists that have joined in the situation without any knowledge at all. And it doesn't do you any good to call him a crook or call him a bad guy because in many ways he may not be, despite what he's doing to everybody. But if you just ask them a simple thing, even if it's the health department, you know, thank you for your opinion. I'm glad you've heard this. I understand you endorse this. Uh, can you send me a, a one toxicological study that you've relied upon, you know, on the continued use of the actual stuff we put in the water? So, anyway, I've hit my time period. I thank you for listening to part of this. Let me give you a telephone number, 800-728-3833. Uh, I have an email, that's even easier in some ways, Green Jeff, it's just my name in reverse, G-R-E-E-N-J-E-F-F, -E -E -F, at Cox, that's C-O-X, dot N-E-T. And if you call either one, you can either call that or send that. Uh, if you just even put nature for it, or even that you were here during this time, I can send you some documents to help you get look at it to begin with, and then I can walk you through stuff, I can guide you through if that's what your intention is. Okay, thank you very much.